uh, as you, uh, for those who don't know me, again, I'm Wayne Tamaska. I'm with, uh, on staff here over at the Stratford Division, uh, for those of you who haven't met me. Uh, we're going to start off the lecture with a, uh, a few questions. These are like pre-lecture questions, and uh, then we'll get on to the lecture. And the first question is, what is the leasing cause of acute surgical abdomen in the elderly population? You know, is it appendicitis, biliary disease, diverticulitis, peptic ulcer disease, or pancreatitis? Uh, all right. The, the correct answer is actually biliary disease. It's B. A 70-year-old patient with a history of diabetes, hypertension, presents to the emergency department with syncope, severe, sudden onset of low back pain. His vital signs are he's got a blood pressure of 80 over 50, a pulse of 120, respirations of 24, a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. The most appropriate initial diagnostic test is A, angiogram, B, ultrasonography, C, CAT scan of the abdomen, D, uh, MRCP, or E, obstruction series. There we go. Okay, go ahead. Okay. And B is the correct. You should do a, a bedside ultrasonography. The patient is, is hypotensive, unstable for uh, any uh, other uh, studies. So, yes, B is the correct answer. And which, is the which of the following statements is true regarding abdominal pain in the elderly? White blood cell counts are specifically elevated in the acute abdomen. Lactate uh, elevations are not an early sign of mesenteric ischemia. Life pace elevation is a specific test for pancreatitis. Positive fecal occult blood testing is specifically useful. And amylase elevation is a nonspecific test for pancreatitis. And what we're really looking for is uh, light pace elevation is specific for pancreatitis. Again, this is uh, the acute geriatric abdomen. And again, we are sponsored by the Reynolds Foundation through a grant. And this is the CAMPER program. Why do we do specifically geriatrics? What's the importance of this lecture? The importance is that the geriatric population is, is rising tremendously. Uh, Right now, one in eight Americans is considered, quote, elderly, which the uh, Census Bureau describes as over 64. Uh, by the year 2030, one in five Americans, or 20% of our population, will be elderly. The elderly who has abdominal pain actually consumes more resources than any other complaint in the emergency department. More tests, more time. Uh, their length of stay is 20% longer than the younger patients and they require admission about half the time, and they require surgical intervention about a third of the time. The overall mortality is, uh, this was a striking statistic too when I read it, of an elderly person who presents with acute onset of abdominal pain has a mortality in the emergency department uh, in excess of 10%. That's rivaling that of acute ST elevation MI. We have some difficulties in diagnosing the elderly too as well. You know, history is, is somewhat difficult in these patients. Say you have a patient with dementia, really can't explain what's going on, or, or expressive aphasia. Sometimes they have hearing loss or vision loss. You know, how many of us have just said, well, you know, I'm going to cut my review system short. You know, I'm screaming at this old lady. She's not hearing what I'm saying, so I'm just going to order more tests. I had uh, one patient that was sent over from the nursing home at one time, aphasic couldn't give any history whatsoever, but just had these diaphoretic episodes. And we did a CAT scan and it showed a big, large uh, kidney stone with a hydronephrosis. So you can't always get a, a history from these patients, which makes things uh, very difficult at times. They have altered pain perception. Uh, there's also polypharmacy. They're on a lot of medications which can interfere with diagnosis. Uh, the elderly may lack the leukocytosis and the fever that we commonly see in younger patients. They all have usually comorbid medical conditions. It's not a, a simple diagnosis. There may be other conditions that factor in. And the elderly frequently have atypical presentations. You said fever, tachycardia can be absent even in the seriously ill. Guarding can be, uh, and uh, rigidity can be lacking in the elderly too. They have a lack of abdominal wall musculature. So the abdominal wall may be lax, and you may not appreciate the, the routine peritoneal signs that we look for in the younger patients. Only 20% of patients 
older than 70 with a perforated viscous uh, presented with epigastric rigidity. So this is free air in the abdomen, they, and they still present atypically. Like I said, we mentioned polypharmacy. There's a lot of medications that can interfere with our diagnosis. The elderly patients tend to be on multiple medications, where younger patients tend to be on less. You know, non-steroidals can block the inflammatory response and uh, decrease uh, the degree of uh, abdominal pain and tenderness. It can also contribute to peptic ulcer disease. NSAIDs and Tylenol uh, decrease the febrile response too. These patients may not present feverish. A lot of patients are on chronic narcotics which can blunt the pain response. Beta blockers too can blunt the tachycardia. So normal blood pressure in these patients too it may not be truly reflective. If you have somebody who's chronically hypertensive and comes in with a normal blood pressure, that may be some relative hypotension for these patients. This is important with our electronic medical record. We have a lot of uh, new gizmos and flashing lights and we have abnormal vital signs that tell us that well, we have to run the room quickly. But you know, these may not light up on our elderly patients. You guys wanted to know the second best answer. Here's some of the statistics on the diagnosis of abdominal pain in the elderly, the acute abdomen. You know, cholecystitis rises with age. You know, you can have nonspecific nexus obstruction and hernia. You still see appendicitis, diverticular disease, perforation and pancreatitis. Now when we take a history on these patients, these are listed as some high yield questions. Uh, these are key questions that we should ask and it gives us uh, a little more insight. You know, age is well, number one. Age means increased risk. Uh, the other one is which came per first, the pain or the vomiting? If pain comes first before vomiting, it's a little more ominous. It's more likely a surgical case. You know, you got to take a thorough surgical history. If you had more surgeries, obstruction is more likely. Is the pain constant or intermittent? A constant pain tends to be worse. Have you had previous episodes? If patients had multiple previous episodes, the statistics are that, uh, that the uh, outcome is not going to be quite as serious. So no previous episodes of this type of pain is more ominous. Cancer history, diverticulosis, pancreatitis, kidney failure, gallstones, inflammatory, inflammatory bowel disease all suggest more serious disease. And we have to get an alcohol history. Could yield pancreatitis, cirrhosis, hepatitis. HIV status in these patients, we tend to uh, not ask that in the elderly, but it's one of the, uh, the uh, largest uh, rising uh, uh, classes of HIV. You can have HIV-related pancreatitis. Are they on antibiotics or steroids? They may mask infection or cause artificial elevations in white count. Do the pain start centrally and migrate to the right lower quadrant? It's still very suggestive of appendicitis. And we got a, also a question for, is there heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, atrial fibrillation? These patients we have to consider abdominal aortic aneurysm and mesoteric ischemia. Our physical exam, the main thing we have to distinguish between the, the well-appearing versus the ill-appearing. But with that, you know, even well-appearing patients, especially elderly, may not present typically, and uh, they may have a serious medical condition. Like I said, fever, tachycardia, hypotension, they may be absent in the elderly. Guarding and rigidity may be absent. The location of the tenderness is generally fairly reliable and uh, as the cause of pain. So we can kind of localize gallbladder pain from appendicitis pain, from diverticular pain in a lot of patients. The physical exam, don't forget to examine the skin. Uh, we see a fair amount of herpes zoster presenting as pain, Collins, Gray Turner sign. You're going to cuscultate for bruises and bowel sounds. A rectal exam may be useful in diagnosing ischemia, GI bleeds, and cancers. What about laboratory testing? Well, we'll find that a lot of it is really nonspecific in the elderly. White counts may be normal in the elderly, even in the face of serious disease. You know, life pace is specific for pancreatitis. Lactate levels are helpful in diagnosing mesenteric uh, ischemia, but it's often a late sign. So what else can we use to help us out? Radiographs, plain x-rays are really a limited value too as well. Uh, you may see free air on an uh, acute abdomen. You may see abdominal aortic uh, calcifications and make you suspicious for uh, AAA. 
abdominal ultrasound is most useful in, you know, certainly evaluating the gallbladder and pelvic organs. Bedside ultrasonography is most useful in unstable patients, too. We may, I think, have a triple A. Now, CAT scanning, you know, we tend to avoid it more and more in the younger population, but really you can't replace it in the elderly population. We, we tend to worry about lifetime risk of cancer a little bit less than the elderly, and, and CAT scanning is one of the probably most valuable diagnostic tools that we have. Uh, we can also do CT. Angiography is replacing a traditional aortography and diagnosing mesenteric ischemia and certainly AAA. Its limitations are probably a little bit more in the elderly. We see a lot of elderly with renal insufficiency and certainly there are uh, contrast allergies. So we are limited in these patients. So we're going to do a little interactive cases here. So you guys can pitch in a little bit. I'm going to tell you some cases and we'll have a little discussion about what we think it is. This is a 73-year-old female, presents with nausea, vomiting, progressive abdominal pain over two days. Blood pressure is 90 over 60, pulse of 88, respirations 24, temperature 38 degrees Celsius. Her past medical history is hypertension, hyperlipidemia, she's had a TIA. Her past surgical history, she's had an appendectomy, a hysterectomy, and a partial colectomy. Her medications, she's on uh, metoprolol, uh, torvostatin, and aspirin. You get in the room, you see an ill-appearing 72-year-old female. She's actively vomiting. She's got a sigillic uh, injection murmur. Her lungs, she has diminished breath sounds. Her abdomen is distended. She has high-pitched bowel sounds, diffuse nonspecific tenderness. No rebound, no bruise, no hernias. Her mucous membranes are dry. Neurologic, she's awake and alert and oriented. She's got one plus edema and symmetric pulses. She does have heme-positive brown stool. We've got some laboratory values. She's got a white count of 12,000, hemoglobin of 9, got a sodium of 150, potassium of 4.8, chloride of 1.5, CO2 of 18, BUN of 33, and a creatinine of 2.8. So has an elevated billy at 2.0. It's got an amylase of 200, got a lipase of 34. She's got 30 urine with uh, 20 whites and 10 red blood cells. So what's the differential diagnosis? Anybody want to throw some out there? Good. Good. Anything else? Yep. All are possible in this patient. We have some some good distractors on this case. There's your radiograph. So the diagnosis is? Yep. Small bowel obstruction. Again, the patient had a CO2 that was decreased. It may make you think for mesenteric ischemia, bilirubin that was up that could have been Gilbert's, that could have led you to stray to, uh, to biliary disease. And you'll notice in this patient, you know, this patient was pretty ill, but there was no tachycardia. The patient was on a beta blocker. You know, white count, amylase, they're all nonspecific in this case. You could see it in a lot of different conditions. Uh, the patient had renal insufficiency, so you may be limited doing an IV contrast study, working up other things. And the elderly have more extensive past surgical history, and this pre predisposed her to her bowel obstruction. A small bowel obstruction is the most common cause for emergency surgical intervention in the elderly. Large bowel obstruction is less common than small bowel, but does increase with age. Large bowel is usually associated with colon cancer or uh, diverticulitis. You can also have a volvulus, too. Uh, sequel volvulus can cause uh, sigmoid or sequel valves can cause large bowel obstruction. Most uh, cases of uh, large bowel obstruction require surgical intervention with the exception of a, a sigmoid volvulus that can sometimes be decompressed endoscopically. Case number two. It's an 85-year-old man for the emergency department with a, a syncopal episode. The patient complains of sudden onset of abdominal and back pain. His vital signs, blood pressure of 95 over 50, pulse of 120, respirations of 24, Temperature of 38. Uh, is hypertensive, diabetic, hyperlipidemia, and prostate cancer. He's had a prostatectomy, appendectomy. His medications include aspirin, captopril, glucophage, and niacin. You get into the room, the physical exam, he's uncomfortable, he's ill appearing, and he's writhing in pain. His heart is regular, no, no murmurs, his lungs are clear. His abdomen is distended, he's obese, so it's a difficult exam. He's got mild, diffuse tenderness, he's got no rebound. No bruise. 
no edema. He's got cool extremities with cyanosis and decreased pulses. His laboratory testing has got a 15,000 white count. He's got a hemoglobin of 8. His electrolytes are fairly normal with the exception of a CO2 of 18. He does have some renal insufficiency, a creatinine of uh, 1.5. He's got relatively normal uh, liver enzymes, and he's got uh, normal light pace. Differential diagnoses. And the diagnosis is? Yep. This is the bedside ultrasonography that uh, we should probably be doing more of. So I'm going to AAA. And here's on CAT scan. You can see a large AAA, and there's rupture of, uh, of blood in the, in the abdominal cavity. There's management. You know, the important thing of this is to recognize it and uh, have vascular consult early and bedside ultrasonography in these unstable patients. As far as abdominal aortic aneurysm, syncope is an ominous sign in the elderly. Whenever these patients pass out, bad things are usually happening. One should always consider abdominal aortic at aneurysm in any patient with back pain. I couldn't find the exact reference on this, but I read this in EM reports a couple years ago, and it was so striking to me that I, I memorized it word for word. Uh, they had it in bold that any patient over the age of 55 with cardiovascular risk factors who presents to the emergency department with a complaint of back pain should have their uh, abdominal aorta visualized by either ultrasound or CAT scan. So that was in the literature. Oh, that's about eight years ago now. So the key to abdominal aortic aneurysm is early recognition, aggressive resuscitation, early vascular intervention, and utility of bedside ultrasonography. Don't wait for a CAT scan to diagnose and uh, mobilize the vascular team. Case number three, an 85-year-old male presents to the emergency department with increasing postprandial abdominal pain. His vital signs, hypertensive, blood pressure 180 over 95, Pulse of 120, respirations of 26, temperature 39. His past medical history, he's got AFib, peripheral vascular disease, hypertension, diabetes. He's had a FEMPOP bypass, a carotid endorectomy, appendectomy. He's on digoxin, uh, Coumadin, um, metoprolol, metformin, and aspirin. You get in the room again, you see another 85-year-old ill-appearing man in considerable pain. His heart is irregularly irregular at 120. His lungs are clear. He's got diffuse nonspecific tenderness. An ab abdominal brewery is present. He's got guarding present. Uh, and neurologically, he's confused but non-focal. He's got one plus edema and diminished pulses. He's got an 18,000 white count. He's got a hemoglobin of 12. His electrolytes are fairly normal, except for a decreased CO2 at 16. It's a little dry. He's got a blood sugar of uh, 380. His liver functions are normal. His amylase is 400. His lipase is 60. His lactate is 6. His INR is 1.4. And his digoxin level is 1.9. And here's his radiograph. What's the differ differential diagnosis? Okay. Good. <laughs> And you've got it. And this is his CAT scan. He's got stranding around the bowel. He's got some uh, pneumatosis intestinale. And ischemic bowel in this patient. He was set up for it. It's a rare disorder, actually. We don't see it that often, luckily. It's only one in 1,000 hospital admissions. But the mortality is huge, uh, 30 90 percent. Uh, and the mortality is really based on the time of diagnosis. Uh, this is another stunning. Uh, figure, the mortality approaches 100% when the diagnosis is delayed uh, for 24 hours or more. Remember, the key on the boards, pain out of proportion to the exam. Rebound is initially absent. When actually, when you have rebound and these patients present, the prognosis is very poor. They may present with gastroenteritis type symptoms in the elderly. Nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea may be the way they present. They may have less abdominal pain. They may show other signs, such as uh, tachypnea and mental status changes. And the laboratory data for ischemic bowel is, is pretty nonspecific. Uh, 
you tend to see leukocytosis, some elevated amylase, and metabolic acidosis, uh, you know, some hyperphosphatemia, some alkphos elevations, you know. Lactate level is certainly helpful, but it's often a late indicator, so you can't rely on that alone. Radiographic studies are often normal early on. Uh, that one x-ray was classic, it had thumb printing, but that's a late sign. It actually has a higher mortality if you see that as well. Angiography has always been the, the gold standard, however, uh, CT angiography is probably replacing that now with a sensitivity of 96%. And you can also pick up a lot of other pathology on CT angiography that you don't see on, uh, on, AR on uh, plain angiography. Next case, we have a 60-year-old male presents with postprandial nausea, vomiting, and epigastric pain without radiation. His vital signs, he's got a blood pressure of 90 over 55, pulse of 80, respiration is 24, temperature of 37 degrees. He's got a hypertension by history, hyperlipidemia, and peptic ulcer disease. His operations include repair of a perforated gastric ulcer. He's on clonidine, uh, aspirin, and omeprazole. He presents diaphoretic, uncomfortable. His heart is regular rate, rhythm without a murmur. His lungs are clear. He's got epigastric tenderness, but he's got no rebound, no guarding, and no bruise. He's got no clubbing, cyanosis, or edema. His pulses are symmetrical. He does have heme-positive brown stool. White count of 10, hemoglobin of 11. He's got a mild elevation of his billy. He's got some mild elevations of amylase. You know, his electrolytes look fairly decent. He's got a blood sugar of 190. There's the radiographic studies that you get. Anything else you guys want to do, or do you want to uh, give me a differential? What do you think he's got? We'll see EKG. Ah, good man. Head of the class. Always get an EKG. Here's this guy. He's got an inferior wall MI. Any, any elderly patient that presents, anybody with any cardiovascular risk factors who complains of abdominal complaint, nausea, vomiting, have a low threshold for ordering an EKG on these patients. There's so many atypical presentations uh, of MI, and especially in the elderly. The elderly may present without any chest discomfort at all. They may even have flu-like symptoms, nausea, vomiting, or syncope. Case number five, a 60-year-old female presents with severe postprandial uh, epigastric pain, has had several episodes in the past few months, but not sought any medical attention until today. There's her blood, her vital signs are fairly stable, she's a little bit tachycardic. She's got a past medical history of hyperlipidemia, osteoarthritis. She's had a hysterectomy, and the only medicine she is, is on is ibuprofen. Your physical exam, she's a moderate epigastric discomfort, radiates to her back. She's got associated nausea, vomiting. She's a little bit tachycardic, her lungs are clear. She's got epigastric and right upper quadrant guarding. No rebound, no bruise. Her extremities are unremarkable. She does have a 15,000 white count, normal hemoglobin. Bilirubin, it's up. Alkphos, it's up. Amylase lipase, they're up. Electrolytes, fairly normal. For Chris, we got the EKG this time. And here's your radiographic study. What's your diagnosis? Yeah. Yeah, he's got clearly demonstrated gallstones on CAT scan. Billy disease is one of the leading causes for acute abdominal surgery in, uh, in the elderly. You know, it, it increases with age. Uh, the when uh, performed urgently, the elderly mortality rate is increased fourfold as compared to younger people. And coleothithiasis increases with age. That's why we see it more and more in the elderly. You also have to realize that the uh, acalculus cholecystitis is very common in the elderly as well. And you may have a fairly unimpressive ultrasound. So if you really have symptoms consistent with uh, cholecystitis in the elderly and negative ultrasound, you have to consider HIDA in these patients. The elderly may not have the nausea and the vomiting, the fever that younger patients do. Laboratory testing is also unreliable. 
leukocytosis is absent in 30 to 40 percent of these patients with uh, cholecystitis. And pancreatitis is the most common uh, non-surgical condition, usually non-surgical in the elderly. Uh, the increase is to 200-fold after the uh, age of 65, and the, the mortality approaches 40 percent after age 70. So that's just huge. We think about, you know, what we do with the MIs and the mortality rate of that, but, you know, an elderly person with, uh, with pancreatitis just has a, has a tremendous mortality rate. Ten percent of the cases present with hypotension and altered mental status. They don't present typically with the, uh, with the pain. The threshold performing CAT scan should be very low in these patients. Ultrasound is certainly more useful for biliary disease. Like I said, we, we mentioned about the HIDA scan and laboratory testing are not too helpful. Lipase is fairly specific, but amylase is not. Case number six, a 65-year-old male presents with increasing nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. The pain preceded the vomiting. Remember, that's worse. Vital signs, you know, a little bit of a tachycardia. He's got a past medical history of rheumatoid arthritis. He's had an inguinal hernia repair, an appendectomy, and a cholecystectomy. His medications, he's on prednisone and methotrexate. His physical exam, uh, he's got nausea and vomiting. Patient does appear ill and uncomfortable. His heart rate's about 100, his lungs are clear. His abdomen distended, diffusely tender. He's got high-pitched bowel sounds. No rebound or guarding. No hernias are palpable. His extremities are uh, unremarkable. And here's your lab work. And you have a 15,000 weight count. And remember, he's on medications too. He's on methotrexate and prednisone, which clouds the picture. His hemoglobin is normal. He's perhaps a little bit dehydrated. He's got an elevated BUN. He's got a blood sugar of 130. And a mild elevation of amylase. Again, nonspecific. His urine, he's got uh, 20 uh, red cells for high power field. And there's your radiograph. Differential, guys? Good. You've got it. Large bowel. You see those large dilations we see with bovulus. Uh, it's less common than small bowel obstruction, uh, but again, the prevalence increases with age. Most common causes are colon cancer, diverticulitis, volvulus. Most require surgical intervention, except for the sigmoid volvulus, which may be decompressed endoscopically. Now we have the uh, same clinical presentation, same laboratory data as the last case, and we got a different radiograph. What do we got? Perforated viscous, probably peptic ulcer disease in this guy, and the, the prednisone, methotrexate, history of ulcer disease. There's the CAT scan. You've got a perforated viscous. And another, another striking statistic, the acute abdomen is the first presentation of peptic ulcer disease in 50 percent of elderly patients. So a lot of these patients are going to present uh, with an acute event. Less half the elderly patients have the classic onset of, uh, of abdominal pain. Rigidity is absent in nearly 80% of elderly patients. Free air is absent in 40% of plain radiographs. Case number eight, a 75 year old female presents with increasing uh, lower abdominal pain, nausea without vomiting, low grade fevers over three days. Blood pressure uh, is uh, fairly normal. Uh, pulse of 100, hypertension is, is, is uh, her history. She's got a history of hysterectomy, and she's on hydrochlorothiazide. She's non-toxic, but uncomfortable appearing. Uh, heart is regular, about 100, no murmur. Lungs are clear. Abdomen is soft, bilateral lower quadrant tenderness. Guarding lower quadrants, no rebound, no bruise or masses. Bowel sounds are present, but decreased. Our extremities are unremarkable. And these are laboratory data. You know, white count normal, hemoglobin normal, mild hypokalemia, T belly up a little bit, mild elevation to amylase. Her urine is dirty. She's got 40 white cells, 
and 30 red cells. What's your differential diagnosis? Hmm? Appendix. Appendix, good. Just be a cystitis, that yeah, sure, he's got 30 yarn. It's a distractor. And there's your CAT scan. And it's sigmoid diverticulitis. A lot of dirty fat, stranding, ticks. The incidence is 50% in patients older than 70 of diverticular disease. 80% after the age of 85. So you have an old person over 85, do they have diverticular disease? Sure they do. You know, you could have a lot of complications with this, abscess, fistula formation, perforation, sepsis. Perforation is much more commonly in elderly patients and it carries a 25% mortality rate. Uh, actually, diverticulitis was clinically misdiagnosed in, uh, in this one study at 50% of the time. Uh, that's without CAT scan, no, it's just on clinical grounds alone. And diverticular irritation may cause the, the pyuria, it may produce hematuria, and can complicate the diagnosis. You may think, well, maybe they've just got cystitis. Same presentation as the last case, but with a different radiograph. It's hard to say in this one. So what can present with a similar type of picture? Appendicide is good. Thought to be a disease of the young, we see appendicitis in the elderly. It's not quite as common, but it's the uh, third most common indication for acute abdominal surgery in the elderly. Uh, less than one-third of the elderly patients have the fever, anorexia, right lower quadrant pain, and le leukocytosis that we see. So they, they present differently and they may not present with classic appendicitis. And the elderly patients tend to be more stoic too. Our younger patients come to the ER after an hour of pain. The elderly patients, a fifth of them present after three days of symptoms. And five to 10% present after a week of symptoms, which gives them uh, higher mortality. They're, you know, the, the mortality in the general population of acute appendicitis is less than 1%, it's very small. But when we get the elderly, it can be as high as four to 8%. All right, I need someone to volunteer for an extra credit case. Go on. Who wants to volunteer for a difficult case? Ellen, you look like you want to volunteer. <laughs> Go on, Ellen, this is your case. You get one, you get one visual, you get a quick diagnosis. <laughs> What's the diagnosis? <laughs> okay, all right. It shows that the physical exam is very important. I see a lot of your residents, you're writing orders before you even see the patient. Yep. When in doubt, examine the patient. All right. Who wants the next extra credit case? Come on, watch you. This is yours. A 55-year-old male presents with increasing abdominal pain, rectal bleeding over the past day. All right. You get one, you get one uh, radiograph. All right, watch you. Diagnosis. There we go. It's actually telephone. <laughs> yep. We make light of these cases, but but uh, there are there are some things that that patients are not going to tell you. They're going to be things that patients are embarrassed to tell you. You know, some of these little old ladies may have things that well they don't want to tell the doctor. And you got to be mindful of that, and you got to be careful in your history. You know, this is you know we're making light of this, but we have to consider you know sitting down with these patients, getting adequate history. And like I said, they're not going to always tell you everything. So some conclusions. The United States population is aging at a tremendous rate. You know, abdominal pain remains one of the most common and potentially serious complications. Atypical presentations are common in the elderly. Laboratory testing, as we've seen, you know, it's, it really lacks any sensitivity or specificity, except in certain cases. You know, normal vital signs may be misleading. That's why with our uh, computerized uh, charting these days, you're not, you may not see the red flags and you have to be careful. And we have to keep the diagnosis broad in the elderly. You can see the whole range of abdominal pains. They can be abdominal and uh, non-abdominal. You know, acute MI uh, can present with abdominal pain. So we have to think outside of the box sometimes. 
we have to use liberal imaging in the elderly. Uh, it's unavoidable. And uh, when we think there's a surgical problem, we have to get early surgical intervention. Serial abdominal exams are very important to see how things change. And finally, the disposition. If you have any elderly patient with persistent abdominal pain, even if they have a negative evaluation, they may not present typically. Their lab work may not be out of whack like a younger patient. I mean, these patients should be observed either in the hospital or as an ED observation patient. So you should never be sending out any elderly patient who still has pain and you don't have a diagnosis. And these patients that are discharged home, you gotta look at a couple things. You have to document they came in, they have clinical improvement. They should have no acute, uh, negative acute testing, and they should be able to tolerate POs. This is always a good challenge for your elderly patient in the emergency department. Well, you know, I'm gonna send them home, but you know, can they eat, can they drink, can they hold things down? And timely follow-up needs to be arranged. You know, you know, reach out to their primary doctor for follow-up. Tell them what's been going on. Don't be afraid to call them. And the caretakers need to be educated too. A lot of these elderly patients may have some degree of dementia. Uh, they may have patients managing their medications. You know, bring the caretakers in the room, go over the, the uh, discharge planning if they do go home. You know, give them signs of things. Well, what do I bring grandma or grandpa back for? You know, what do I look out for? What should be uh, worrisome? References? Any final questions at all? I'm just going to make a point out about the, the very last slide that you had, that first bullet. I think we should, you know, we really need to be pressing these inpatient docs. And even though your initial evaluation is, is normal, you just can't send these people home. It, it, I agree. It's, it's difficult, yeah. And we need to, we need to educate yeah. Yeah, the internists as well. You know, I know you do. I know you do. Did you see that bad case that, you know, it wasn't initial there, and two days later mm -hmm. come back? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these interns, they're overworked. You know, it's another case, and you got somebody presenting with normal labs, normal things, and, you know, you know your, your gut instinct is to send them home, but it's not always the right thing to do. And that's why you need to, we, we do. We need to sit down to them and explain our concerns. Any other questions? You guys did all great on the cases. All right, thank you.